Hello, I'm Brandon Martini, a commercial pilot and flight instructor. And I'm Carson Vasquez. I'm a private pilot. And you're listening to the Aviation Mentors Podcast, sponsored by Stratus Financial. So buckle up, because the Aviation Mentors are taking off. Hey, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, We have another awesome topic we're going to talk about, and it's one that's really near and dear to my heart. Um, It's one of my favorite things in the world, and that is seaplanes. Um, This whole episode, we're going to talk about different seaplanes I've flown, and uh, which isn't uh, that many, actually. And I don't have that many hours in seaplanes, but I sure love it. I mean, there's there's nothing like uh, boating, and there's nothing like flying. And when you put the two together, it changes your life. At least it did for me. And uh, now it's kind of turned into an obsession of mine uh, about landing on water. And uh, I'm going to talk about some of the things today. And Carson's going to ask me some questions on what it was like to first get a seaplane rating and to learn to fly seaplanes and and currently flying seaplanes. And also an awesome seaplane I got to fly uh, just not too long ago uh, with some uh, great clients. So uh, I'm really excited for today, Carson. Thanks so much for uh, bringing up this idea. I think it's going to be a really cool one to talk about. Yeah, I figured you had a long week, and uh, you would love to talk about something that you'd love to talk about all the time. And just so everyone knows, we talk about seaplanes way more than the normal pilot does. Uh, I talk about them enough, and I don't have a seaplane rating. So Brandon loves talking about them. Uh, so Brandon, how did you get into seaplanes? This, how did this obsession really start? Well, you know, just watching uh, YouTube videos like most student pilots do. I kept on seeing YouTube videos on uh, on seaplanes and beavers and different things on floats and even airplanes on skis, which I really, really want to do. Um, it's been on my bucket list to do for like two years now, like flying on skis on snow. I think that'd be cool too. But uh, back to seaplanes. So <laughs> I'm going to get a little uh, distracted if I start thinking about ski planes. Uh, that's just that's just a blast. And you don't need a special rating or an endorsement to fly a ski plane. It's just a normal, it's technically landing on land. At least that's how I, I look at it. But even if it was landing on water, I guess I have the rating for that too, because it's just frozen water, right? It is. Uh, how, do, how do you stop on skis? I, I feel like there's no way. That's a great question. I think we're going to have to get somebody on the podcast <laughs> to answer it. Uh, because I looked into it a little bit. I think the only way for you to stop on skis is uh, it's just to control your energy uh, and aerodynamic braking, at least that's what I think Uh, would make sense to have like a pick in the back or something that like slows you down. I don't know. We'll have to get somebody who knows about ski planes uh, to talk about it. But, um, but yeah, so how did I get started with uh, seaplanes? I was just watching YouTube videos mostly and I absolutely loved checking them out online. I would just watch seaplane videos all day long, like uh, um, out of uh, what's a place in uh, up North in Washington. Uh, I was watching a bunch of seaplanes in Washington and then I saw one, uh, at Oshkosh fly over. And then I found out, this was my first year at Oshkosh. I found out there was a seaplane base at Oshkosh. So I had to go there and I saw all these planes sitting on water and I'm like, they're all floating. They actually move on water. They're not sinking. Um, and they meant to land here. And I got really excited and it just kind of made me watch even more YouTube videos about seaplanes and flying in Alaska And then around this time, all of those shows on TV, like Discovery Channel, they were coming out with different TV shows that like landed in Alaska and the wilderness and bush flying. And I watched all those things and I was like, oh, this looks really, really cool. Like this is way better than just flying my 172 in the pattern or doing something like that. I want to go do something rad like this. And uh, I ended up just uh, getting kind of obsessed with seaplanes. And then uh, one thing led to another. Now I'm seaplane rated. And, uh, it's been, it's been quite a, a fun little journey for sure. Pretty awesome, uh, journey going from, you know, it was like when we talked with Gemma, uh, he used to just play on the simulator the same way you'd watch your YouTube videos. And now, you know, he's type rated in the plane, he's flying on the simulator and here you are, want to get your ATP for a seaplane. <laughs> so what was the training like to get your single engine seaplane and multi, you know, there's not a lot of places we can fly in SoCal and go get it. So I know you had to travel for it. Um, Remember how excited you were when you got your multi-engine seaplane? You sent a picture from, was it Florida? Yeah, Florida. You sent a picture of the to uh, to my phone. I, I saw it, and you just had the biggest smile on your face when you had that. Uh, it was the multi-air air cam. Yeah, that was pretty cool. Uh, but what was that training like? Absolutely. I'll start off with the single engine. Um, so I went out to a place called like Havasu Seaplane, and I flew a plane uh, November 172 Mike Yankee. I think that's what it was. And uh, I flew with this guy who, uh, old time bush pilot, 
a really cool down to earth guy named Mo Martin. And uh, he snowboarded in Lake Havasu. Uh, he's actually from, I think, the Northeast somewhere. And uh, he's uh, recently sold the company. And then I can't even find the airplane that I flew. Um, I don't know. It, it like disappeared in Alaska or not Alaska, in Idaho. And uh, it like goes off the radar. Um, so I'm hoping nothing happened to that airplane or Mo Martin. Uh, he's a really cool guy. Um, awesome pilot to fly with. Learned a lot from him. But another guy took over, and I think he has a, a beaver on floats or, or something there now. Uh, I, I'm not too familiar with it, but I know he did sell that, that company to somebody else. But uh, learning to fly was pretty cool. I did it in like a three- or four-day course, and it almost got canceled on me like two or three times. I couldn't get the DPE, couldn't make it, and the airplane went down for maintenance, and then weather was looking bad, and all of these things were just not going well. And I'm like, oh, this is horrible. I don't actually, I'm a pretty busy guy as Carson knows. And I mean, that might be a really an understatement. Literally I live and die by my calendar. Um, sometimes when we're trying to reschedule, like recording these episodes, it's like impossible to even find a slot, um, unless we're doing it like crazy remotely and not in the office or something. So I got over to Lake Havasu and I started doing my seaplane training, uh, with Mo and, I wasn't sure if I was actually going to get a check ride. I was supposed to do a check ride like Sunday or Monday or whatever day it ended up being from this three or four day course. And I guess the DPE, he was from somewhere in Arizona as well, but they had snow at his airport. Uh, Cause I did it in like, I don't know, February or something. I can't remember, but February, March. So it had to have been earlier than that because there was snow, right? So it could have been earlier than that. Regardless. I guess the DPE could not get his plane and he was going to fly in because it was just too far to drive. He couldn't get his plane out of his hangar just to come to the airport and uh, give me a check ride. So I was doing all this training and thinking, oh, there's maybe I might not even uh, might not even be able to fly um, and do a check ride, which is going to suck. But if it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, it doesn't. I mean, it's aviation. Things happen. Maintenance on airplanes, weather changes, literally everything. There's a reason why. I haven't been able to go flying except for yesterday uh, for like two weeks because uh, the weather's just been trash lately, at least in Southern California. And I, I think all kind of all over the, the States it is right now as well. But outside of that, so the first time I took off, I took off on Amphibs uh, out of Lake Havasu Airport, K H uh, I I yeah. Hotel India, India. And uh, we took off and it taxied a little bit different because now you have four wheels instead of three, which was kind of interesting to taxi on. It's even more interesting to land on, by the way, um, but not difficult whatsoever. So then we took off and he showed me kind of how to read the water and most like, hey, we're going to we're going to land straight over here um, kind of right after we departed. I said, already, we're going to land. We're not just going to fly around a little bit. He said, no, we're landing on the water right away. And he had me check that the gear was up for water landing a bunch of times, which is weird to say gear is up on landing because uh, I don't know about everybody here, but you normally doing t- some type of gump or gumps check or B gumps or whatever you get, get taught. Um, and you want that landing gear to be down. So it was really unnatural to say landing gear up. Uh, so I've trained myself and it was probably due to Mo. Uh, he trained me to say up for water landing down for land landing. Um, and so every time I'd land on water, I'd say gear is up for water landing. Cause if you just say gear up, gear down, there's not enough words for you to actually think about it. But if you say gear up for water landing, now, you know, It's actually up for water landing. So I still use that today when I'm flying the icon. I say gear is up for water landing, which is a really good thing. If your gear is down, you will tumble and you could die. Uh, And if you don't just die from the crash, you could die of drowning. I don't want to do that. So I'm going to make sure uh, that, that I, that I have the gear up. So we're coming in for landing and it's just kind of a standard approach. Uh, You come up with a little bit of power, at least on that 172 with Amphibs, as far as I could remember. Um, Not a ton, but just a tiny bit of power and you want to slow your descent rate. And then right before you you land, you're going to do a, a little flare and just a tiny tad bit of power. Uh, not so much where you float, but enough to kind of cushion yourself uh, when you're touching down on the water. And I, I don't know, I couldn't control the feeling like inside of me that this was unnatural because it felt like an emergency to me. When you're coming down and you're looking at water, I mean, if you go to a place and, and it's legal uh, for you to get close to water, um, I would get, I would get down pretty close to the water and just feel how unnatural that feels. Make sure you do it in a safe environment. That's of course legal, but when you're getting close to water, it does not feel right. It feels like you're about to crash, uh, legitimately. That's my first feeling. I just did not like the feeling. And as soon as we touch the water and I see water kind of splashing up off the, off the floats, 
I was like, oh my gosh, this is so cool. This was the most cool experience I've ever had. I can't believe that I've been waiting this long for it. So it was, it was really nerve wracking. And then it happened and I was super excited about it. So we touched down on that water and that was just the best feeling ever. And then obviously just kind of flying around and uh, you can turn the airplane into kind of a jet ski by doing a, you can do a, what's called a step taxi, uh, which is a lot of fun. And I love doing that uh, on the icon because the icon kind of feels like a jet ski. <laughs> um, it does look like a jet ski, Carson, a little bit. It's like a jet ski with wings. Um, so I like step taxiing and we did all sorts of other things. We did short field, short field landings through like little canyon areas and all sorts of fun stuff. But you asked about the multi-engine Multi-engine I already knew what to expect. Uh, but of course it was like gusting crosswinds when I went to do my multi-engine uh, in the middle of November in Florida or beginning of November in Florida. There were gusting crosswinds. Uh, we were like exceeding the crosswind component of this air cam that I did it in multi-engine air cam. It was a pretty cool airplane. Might sound like a really dumb question. Uh, I just don't know anything about seaplanes. Can't you just change where you're landing and land into the wind? You're a hundred percent right. Yes, you can change where you're landing and land into the wind. But when you're taking off on amphibs off of a runway first, we, we had a gnarly crosswind. And of course the runway that would have been perfect got closed by the airport like two years prior. Um, so we didn't get to, to use the proper runway that would have been like perfect for us to take off in. So it was a, it was a fun, it was a fun takeoff and even more fun landing. I was lucky. My, uh, my instructor would just kind of let me kind of do everything. Uh, but the first time I took off, it did not feel like a normal airplane. That air cam takes off. You have to like go vertical for about three seconds. At least it felt like that. Obviously it wasn't vertical, but you, you have a pretty high, crazy climb pitch and then it kind of levels off, uh, once you, once you get in the air. Uh, but the air cam is a blast to fly. I would recommend flying one to anybody I've ever met. Uh, even the, I haven't flown the tailwheel version, but I know several people that have that says it's a blast to fly as well. Um, so I want to fly the tailwheel version too. But that air cam was so much fun to fly. Honestly, the, the multi-engine aerodynamics are the same uh, on every air, uh, not every airplane, but they're really the same on that versus uh, the Baron or a Duchess or anything I typically fly. Um, so it wasn't really that big of a deal with the multi-engine aerodynamics because I've taught it so much, but it was a little bit different just feeling, uh, the airplane kind of like falls from under you. When you pull the power, that thing drops just like the icon. You pull the power, it will drop. Um, those things need power to continue flying. They, they don't fly well without power. Uh, everybody who, who says like a Piper arrow or a Cherokee drops like a rock. And I've heard this saying like, what, what has a worse glide ratio, a brick or a, or a Piper? And, and I think that's not that true, actually, after I, I cut the power on the, uh, the icon or I cut it on, on an air cam, uh, I think that, a an arrow or, or a chair, old school Cherokee with the Hershey bar wings, they, uh, they fly really, really well in comparison with no power. So it's a little bit different, but, uh, I had a blast landing. We landed in a bunch of, uh, a bunch of wind, unfortunately. So it wasn't as fun. Sailing was quite hard because you couldn't turn uh sometimes so you had to be really specific on on where you you went but on that trip was probably one of my coolest trips that i ever did because i was flying from uh where we were doing in sebring doing the training in sebring florida and we flew to jack brown's where i did a, a check ride in the air cam with uh, uh mr brown I, I can't remember which brown it was but he was an awesome guy um, it was a second check ride. I was able to do him my, my, uh, flip flops, which I was really excited about. He didn't care. He had flip flops on himself. It was a pretty cool and mellow check ride. Both had shorts on a t-shirt. Um, it was uh, relaxing and, and a great time. Uh, but on my way to Jack Brown's, um, I got to fly next to bald eagles. And when you're in an open cockpit and you're getting to see bald eagles soaring around you, that was probably one of the most memorable flights I've ever had. And it was just like an hour flight from one airport to another. And we're just cruising at, I don't know, 75 or 80 knots on the way to a check ride. And I got to soar with bald eagles. That was probably the coolest thing I've ever done flying. Because in California, we don't have that many of them. Uh, we, don't, we have to go mountains in certain areas to even see a bald eagle. And I know they're a lot more common in Florida. But uh, it was very cool to see kind of the representation of america um and i'm soaring along next to it it was pretty rad that's awesome I, I really don't think a lot of experiences can beat that that's just that's awesome uh my, my closest experience to something that was you know kind of as memorable as soaring bald eagles was the first time i saw a seaplane um when i saw the seaplane base when i went to oshkosh 
you, you're like, we have to go. This is a priority. <laughs> we are going to go see the seaplane base. Uh, so we, we took an Uber, went, got over there. And just like Brand said, watching those airplanes just hanging out in the water, uh, watching an airplane float. And I think maybe a couple of week, weeks or months before we went to Oshkosh, uh, I watched Sully. So seeing an airplane on water uh, was a much different experience at Oshkosh <laughs> than in that movie. Uh, it, it was crazy, though. It's just watching them taxi on the water. It looks like majestic, like this big old airplane just on this glassy water. It was, it was so cool. Uh, and I didn't ask you a lot of questions. I was just kind of walking around over there watching. Uh, you hung out with Austin Damaris, and I was just walking around. So, uh, but a lot of things I wanted to know kind of came about with the training uh, for Seaplane. So it looks like you can throw floats on any airplane to make it a seaplane. Is that true, or does there are limitations to it? To be honest, I don't know a ton about that particular question. Um, and I think that what's – I'm not going to say I'm a good or a great instructor, but I think that's what makes me an adequate one. Um, and some people think I'm good, <laughs> I, I think. Some people might think I'm horrible. I don't know. It doesn't really matter. Um, but uh, I, I don't like to pretend I know something when I don't. So um, I know a little bit about this subject, but I don't know a lot. Um, I know that certain floats are rated for certain weights. I know they're rated for certain displacements of water. Um, and it kind of depends. And then I know that there are, are um, STCs for certain airplanes that you can install floats on. But I've seen floats on a lot of different airplanes. Uh, the most common are are uh, a lot of bush planes. I know beavers on floats. They're probably more common. I, I wouldn't. I don't know for sure, but I've seen more beavers on floats than I have um, with wheels wheels on them. And uh, I I know that I've seen some 172s with with anfibs like I saw. It. I've seen some with straight floats. There's cubs with floats. Uh, so there's lots of airplanes that have floats, and some of them are have a whole body, just like the Icon does. So it's more like a, a boat, uh, per se. Um, do those floats af affect airspeed? Uh, yes, it does. It slows down the airplane. Uh, it does create drag. Um, a lot of these airplanes need uh, some power modifications to overcome the added drag. But these floats are also made in an aerodynamic way for and hydro hydrodynamic ways. Uh, they need to land on water. They need to separate themselves from water in certain ways. That's what the step is for. And, uh, and they also need to be semi-aerodynamic, uh, even though they're not really generating lift. They're generating more drag. But they can't just be a big brick stopping you in the middle of the air. They have to let air pass through them uh, relatively well. And you'll see some of the struts and crossbars. Um, they also are kind of concaved. So... Um, they're decreasing the amount of drag as well. So yeah, they, they affect uh, airspeed and, and you can throw them on most airplanes, just not all airplanes. That's cool. I figured it could either be just like crazy drag, like having a brick on the bottom of the airplane, or it can be something like wheel pants. Uh, sounds like it's kind of in between with depending on how they're, how they're made. So that's pretty cool. Um, and this is a story that I've wanted to hear for a while. Uh, something I've been, I've been asking since you actually went on this trip. Uh, so Brandon got to fly the Grumman Albatross, and he was super excited about it. He talked about it for a while, but I never heard the whole thing. I just know he, he got to fly it. I haven't seen any pictures or anything. Um, but Brandon, what was it like flying that Albatross, and how how did you even get that to happen? How did you get that set up? So this is the coolest airplane I've ever got to fly. Um, a Grumman Albatross, by the way, if you don't know what it is, Google it right now. Go ahead and take a break from the podcast. Go Google it, Google it, and come back and start listening again. Uh, because uh, Grumman Albatross is a beautiful giant airplane. Um, it happens to be one of the largest airplanes I've ever flown. Um, I uh, I ended up getting uh, SIC uh, signed off for this airplane. I haven't went into the FISDO and got the type yet, but uh, but I can get SIC typed in this airplane now. I've had all the necessary training to do it, uh, but it. It came from uh, just friends, friends that I know and connections. So I've talked in other episodes about making connections and making friends in this industry and just talking to everybody you know and and tell them what you're into in, in airplanes and flying. And as we all know, I talk about seaplanes uh, quite a bit. I may not talk about them on, the, on each episode, but the icon gets brought up quite a bit, right? So that means I do like seaplanes. <laughs> it's one of my favorite things. That might be the reason why this episode's going a little long today. It's because I have such a passion for seaplanes. It really is just a blast for me to go land on water in something that also flies. It's just two of my favorite things. I love boating and I love flying and both of them together is just like gives me goosebumps. It's perfect for me. Um, but I just made connections. I made friends in this industry and um, I, there's a DP that I know that I've done a 
couple check rides with and he calls me up and says, Hey Brandon, didn't you get your multi-engine seaplane rating a year or so ago? I said, absolutely. I did. Uh, he said, have you used it much? I said, no, not much at all. Um, everyone was telling me how stupid it was for me to go get it because I couldn't fly any planes around here and no one would rent me one. And I don't know anybody who has one, but I got it anyways, cause I thought it was cool and I like collecting ratings. And he said, well, maybe your little gamble paid off. And I said, well, how so? He said, I got a friend of mine. He's got, um, he's got an airplane. He's, he needs, uh, he needs flown. He needs a, a second pilot in that plane. I said, well, I need to get checked out in it, et cetera, et cetera. He said, yeah, I, I know. I know all the, the specifics. I said, okay, let me talk to him and, and we'll try to make this, this work. So he called me like three times to fly this airplane. And each one of them, I was like out of town and I couldn't move anything because like my schedule is always crazy. And on like the second or third or fourth time, whatever it was, he called me. He said, hey, I really need you this time. Is there any way you could make anything work? I looked at my schedule and I had a few appointments and meetings. And I said, yep, I'm just going to cancel everybody and everything. <laughs> um, I didn't have anything too important or crazy. So I canceled a whole bunch of things um, that I had going on. And I went over to Chino Airport and I, I went over to him and I introduced myself and I started getting acclimated with this aircraft. And we ended up, uh, he ended up checking me out. We went up for a few hours, um, and burned a lot, a lot of gas. And, uh, I used, I learned how to use reverse thrust on landing, which was really neat. Um, it changed the pitch of the propeller. The airplane, the airplane is heavy. Uh, people talk about airplanes being heavy all day long. This plane is legitimately heavy. Um, there's hydraulics that move quite a bit of, uh, the controls and this plane is heavy. Uh, when you pull back on that uh, on that control wheel, it's pulling back with a lot of force. When you are changing from uh, from normal thrust to reversing those propellers, it takes a lot of force with your hands. On like with your, my hands were bleeding by the time I was done flying this airplane. I'm serious. It was it was that much um, work to fly this airplane. I mean, the airplane's 75 years old or or, or so. Uh, but uh, flying it was really docile in the air. The stall characteristics were really neat. Single engine characteristics were were really kind of docile. Um, it was just a super fun plane to fly. I mean, the empty weight on this plane is 22,000 pounds. The max takeoff weight is like 37,500 pounds. Um, <laughs> it's a, uh, it's a, it's a really heavy airplane and the controls are actually heavy. That's what I mean by a heavy airplane. Cause it's got a lot of power, obviously. It's also got uh, twin radial engines. Uh, those things are a little finicky. They they fly well, but they're just not the same as what we normally fly on our normal reciprocating engines that we, we use with Continental or Lycoming engines on all of our normal airplanes. But after I got checked out in this airplane by a hell of an instructor that I had, um, he was also the captain for the day. He was just a, he was a fantastic instructor. Uh, so we end up going uh, and doing, uh, doing our, our checkout flight for a little while. And after we landed back at Chino, um, we, we, got our, got our friends and, and everybody. And we wanted to go up to, uh, uh, we want to go to Reno air races. So we ended up taking off and, uh, we wanted to go, go stop in the water in Tahoe. So we actually landed in Lake Tahoe. Uh, and that was an amazing experience landing that big of an airplane in Lake Tahoe and even more so taking off in Lake Tahoe, um, in that aircraft, that is a big airplane to land and take off on some water. Uh, we just had so much fun doing it. It was uh, one of the most memorable things that I've ever done in my life. I do have some pictures and videos. So if you run into me at, at uh, Fasana or you run into me at, uh, at Air Venture or Sun and Fun or something, please ask me to show them to you and I will. Uh, they are really, really, really neat pictures uh, and videos that I have um, of some of the flight that we did. So um, by far, that's my favorite airplane I've ever flown. Um, it happens to have wings and it happens to be a boat and, uh, it's, uh, it's just a fantastic flying machine. And, uh, I, I think that's on my, my list of planes that I want to own one day. Uh, and I think I will, uh, there's, I know one for sale right now. I'm just waiting for the economy to go down a little bit and maybe I'll buy it. Uh, but, uh, it's a little too expensive for me at this point, but it's a beautiful plane. And if anybody ever gets to go fly one or fly in one, I would highly recommend it. Uh, that albatross will uh, will blow your mind on uh, the capabilities and uh, and just fun that you will have flying it for sure. It is seriously like one of the biggest planes I've seen in a long time. Um, I haven't gotten to actually go up close and see it, but I have seen it before. This thing's massive, 
And you know, Brandon's a huge fan of airplanes. Obviously, he's got almost every rating you can go and get. And he's a huge fan of boats. He loves both of them. Uh, he loves seaplanes. And today I put about three questions on paper and said, hey, I'm going to ask you these three. And he was like, oh, it's going to be a five-minute episode. I was like, no, it's not. This man loves all three of these things. <laughs> so here we are, uh, you know, 25 minutes in. And obviously, tons of talk about seaplanes. Uh, they're just they're awesome. They're so cool. And if you don't think a seaplane rating is right for you, it is. Go check out the seaplane base, uh, especially one at Oshkosh. Uh, I had zero interest in seaplanes. I was like, oh, it's it's cool, but no, nothing I'm interested in, nothing I want to go do or see uh, until I saw them in action. There's just something about seeing a plane moving on the water and taking off from a lake. It's so awesome, just amazing. And seeing it made me want to go out and get my seaplane rating. That's on my schedule for next year. I have to get a couple normal ratings first, but... This is pretty awesome, and you know, there's so many different orders you can go and get the ratings in, and I can't really go and get the fun ones quite yet, just because I need to go get instrument commercial um, for my own personal reasons, but these things are awesome. Go get your seaplane rating, go look at them, go check them out, see if you can take a flight in them, even if you can, and it's just absolutely worth it. Well, Carson, thanks for putting together this uh, this subject today. I, uh, I, I wasn't sure how long this was going to be. Like I said, I thought it was only going to be a five minute episode. I'm like, hey, Carson, this script is not very long today for questions. And, and I was uh, brutally wrong. <laughs> Over 20 minutes is a great episode. I, I love this topic. So Carson, thank you so much for bringing it up to me. And thank you listeners for listening today. As you can tell, I absolutely have a enormous passion for seaplanes and seaplane flying. If you fly seaplanes, shoot us some pictures. We'd love to see them. We'll put them on our, on our website or Instagram or Facebook page. As always, if you want to reach out to either one of us and you want to send us those pictures or shoot us some questions on seaplanes you can reach us at twitter or instagram for carson it's at carson underscore av17 and for me it's at mr martini guy and as a wrap up for the day remember we're here to guide you in our aviation and seaplane journey so fly safe and enjoy the ride